the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with a Mauna Loa update today on Friday, April 16th, 2021, here with Mr. Dane DuPont on behalf of HawaiiTracker.com, and we're going to give you guys a little summary of what's happening in the last week and give, put it in context for you guys and go into a little more detail um, for those, those of you guys that are looking for more information on Mauna Loa, seeing as it's been in the news quite a bit recently. Um, Dane's going to be manning our chats, collecting some questions. Uh, we are not going to talk about Kilauea a whole lot today. Uh, if you're here for Kilauea, uh, there's not been a whole lot of changes on Kilauea. But we'll go in more detail and kind of uh, collect all the different uh, information we can um, for next week, Tuesday, about Kilauea. So, Mauna Loa today. Uh, today we're looking at a, a Mauna Loa summit. And this is the Mauna Loa uh, ML cam from the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory are the source of almost all if not all of our data here and you can see the view up here quite clear and calm a little bit of snow left over from the more recent snowfall that's been up there let's go down here show you guys the last 24 hours black at night not a whole lot happening in the daytime very nice up there nice and cold uh, there's a thermal camera up there as well here's a thermal view that same image not a whole lot in there yeah i've got to zoom out so you can see on on this end over here on the right, we're here in a scale. The top of the scale never gets above anywhere near like 100. So that's showing you that it's really quite cool up there. That's what really matters is the scale up here. We have 
similar colors on a kiloway thermal, but that's only because it scales all the way up to 600 or more Celsius. And here you see it's always below uh, 100. It might peak at 40s in the middle of the day there when the sun is shining in the middle of that black lava rock. But really, no heat, no gas coming out of Mauna Loa. Uh, the most interesting signal we have has been uh, the GPS. Um, and that's what I thought I would show you guys this camera. This is the, the, the camera on the south side of Makua Veo Veo Mauna Loa Summit Crater. So we're looking at the distance across the caldera. We're more or less looking from the summit right around here to somewhere to the right of where this camera is placed over here. That's more or less that cross caldera distance that the GPS measures. And um, the swelling is happening underneath here in this big valley that's the caldera. So the most interesting signal here is the GPS. This is the, the clean local length between north part of Mokua Veo Veo and the south part. And as we've been discussing, we had a big drop here, a big contraction. This is measuring distance across the caldera. So when it gets smaller, that means the magma is, is typically leaving that area in between those two stations. And when it's getting farther apart, it's because it's coming in and swelling and pushing them apart. It also matters whether they're going up or down and that, that other motion and not just right there, but everywhere around the stations as well. So we'll discuss that a little bit as we do have uh, that NSR image to review as well. But after that big contraction that's been happening for a couple weeks, uh, that began in the middle of March. We've now reverted back within the last week here to stable to slightly extending again. So it seems like this adjustment, even though it was a fairly big one, seems to have been temporary um, as the USGS uh, reported in their update early on. And we're back to a, a, an extending trend here. So if you look on a five year plot of the GPS, you can see that this upward trend, right? So we have, we had an upward trend even while Kilauea was erupting um, out of its summit and Pu'o'o. May 2018, right in here, this phase is kind of flattish. That's the era of the, the summit swelling, lava lakes overflowing, and lower east rifts on eruption of Kilauea. And you can see that after that is when we've been climbing up at a higher rate, a higher rate from here to here steeper here than previously over here. And we've discussed uh, uh, through possible poor pressure connections of the volcanoes, uh, this might be some response to the, the, the ceasing of output of lava on Kilauea. Um, but then we also have now these small adjustments right in here, the one that happened earlier, um, November last year, and the one that's a little bit bigger now, um, just happening in the last couple weeks here. The, end of March and beginning of April here, April. If we scroll up to the GPS, I'm sorry, to the tilt, ground tilt here, ground tilt at the north part of that, northern part of the caldera, uh, you don't see a whole lot in this last week plot, so we'll, we'll switch back to the last month. Coincident with the time when we had that second swarm of earthquakes, most recently on Mauna Loa's flanks, right in here we had uh, a, a Quick dropping of the tilt, not a huge amount. We're talking about from one and a half micro radians down to ultimately minus one and a half micro radians, three micro radians total. It's not a huge, huge signal, but uh, noticeable because it uh, actually actually bucked the trend here. Or, and it was on this deflationary trend for a while, just until the last week or so, week and a half, where you can see it flattened out and now is actually. Um, showing the opposite sense of tilt, uh, inflationary sense of tilt right there. So interesting that, you know, the adjustment begins here and essentially it ends here. And this is the, the that, that uh, deviation we saw on the GPS also corresponding there. And likewise, the changing uh, more recently as well. So that's the, that's the interesting um, signals there. Let's look at the, what the USGS actually says in their text update here. Uh, they do report. Mauna Loa is not erupting. Data streams show no significant change in deformation rates or patterns that would indicate increased volcanic hazard at this time. So it's, they're all interesting little changes. We'll put it all in context for you guys. Uh, but nothing profound really has happened that uh, has changed the prognosis in the short term for this volcano. In the long term, it's still going to erupt. And in the medium term, it's still going to erupt as well. But in the short term, we, we, we don't have any indication that we're shifting gears uh, upwards towards that yet. We're still in the adjustment building phase. 
Um, nevertheless, that does mean um, earthquakes happening around a volcano. 220 small magnitude earthquakes beneath Mauna Loa. Uh, I believe it was 188 below the summit upper elevation flanks. All less than 2.5 and all mostly below 5 miles uh, below the ground level. Um, within, yeah, I'm sorry, within, so above that level, right? Within 5 miles of the ground, 8 kilometers down. They do note GPS measurements showing recent variability in summit deformation patterns. Moving from contraction to slightly extensional. And then they mentioned no gas, nothing else there. I won't read through it all. But I want to kind of go back in time. And uh, we did have some shallow earthquakes at the beginning of March that were very shallow underneath Mauna Loa Summit. But very quickly, uh, March 10th USGS update was when we had a first special update on a series of uh, earthquakes. This was Kawiki, a Kawiki swarm that occurred uh, 11 miles north northeast of Pahala, 16 miles down, right? That was the first, the first flank adjustment there. Then I'll skip forward March 18th. We had another uh, flank adjustment, in this case, Kawiki again, right? It was uh, quite a bit shallower, but also in Kawiki, March 18th. That was a special alert put out by the USGS. April 1st, another swarm. This one was the one that was occurring uh, beneath that northwest part that northwest uh, of the caldera, which is still active a little bit today, but not at these same rates. And so, but still in a, in, in a signs of adjustment there. April 3rd, moving forward there, that was when we had that 4.3 and 3.9 earthquakes near Pahala, adjustments in the flank there. So no surprise then that when we come to, to, to today that you know, we're, we're, we're seeing adjustments in the flank of the volcano here. And so looking at the last week here, you can see that this pattern northwest of the summit continues, but everything else is, is as it has been in the background. There's no new swarms, no new clusters or earthquakes showing here. We're curious about this most recent one. It's showing up as a 1.0 at 4.4 kilometers down, not quite three miles down. So it's similar in that same pattern right in there. That's a typical area for those earthquakes to occur as a volcano is swelling and adjusting. So that doesn't mean anything uh, ominous in and of itself. It's just showing that it's going through that adjustment. So it's interesting that we had a lot of earthquakes more so on the flanks recently going along with that contractionary phase. And prior to that, when we had shallow earthquakes around the summit region uh, is when we had that extensional. So now that we're switching back to extension, it's, it's, it's curious to think about whether we might possibly expect more of those shallow earthquakes uh, above the, the, the magma reservoir um, and less of the adjustment ones in the flank. I mean, it kind of goes in a cycle like that. I'll cover that here shortly. Um, in a little bit more detail for the earthquakes, here is a map for the past month from the USGS HVO. You can see at the summit area, mostly concentrated around the northwest. Definitely um, a few events here in that summit, upper southwest rift, but Really, compared to the levels we've seen for most of the rest of the year, not a whole lot happening there, actually, right? Actually, you have less activity at the summit and more so on the flanks, all those swarms that, were, that induced alerts by the USGS that I just uh, recapped for you guys. So looking at the past month here, uh, earthquake rates, earthquakes per day is on the left, 100. This peak right here is close to 120 that occurred in that swarm that was uh, at the end of March, between March 29th and 31st. And you see that it adjusted and then went back to background. And then you see there was this other adjustment here and then back to background again. And so we're still at this background level that currently in the last uh, four or five days has been below 20 earthquakes per day. But really before that, less than 30 earthquakes per day. And really that one peak of 70 is the, the only one within the last week or so that that uh, sh is showing that major adjustment. And that might have been the last one before we saw the changeover. Um, and the tilt and the changeover in the GPS there, possibly even overlapping there a little bit. Uh, I wanted to point out here, there's this plot right below the earthquake rates, and this one is showing uh, depth on a y-axis here and time on the x-axis, right? So similar to this past month here. And I wanted to point out this pattern, which is kind of hard to see because this graph is so tiny, but if I zoom it way in, you can see the scale here, 0, 10 kilometers. So these red ones up here are the ones happening above the summit, essentially, the shallower ones, the adjustment around the magma chamber. And you see that was happening here, and uh, 
right around the 27th, you see it really tails off, although it kind of stutters to a, to a halt here. And that's when these flank earthquakes pick up right in here, more in that 5 to 8, 10 kilometer depth right here, marked in orange. So I'm going to pan it to the right. You can see, yeah, still, still adjustments um, in the shallow part. But really, that that background level that you can see uh, shallower above the, the magma reservoir disappears in favor of the flank adjustment ones right through here. And so pan it over here to the side. And you can see that the flank adjustment kind of comes in bursts. A little bit of a gap right in there. Another burst right through here. And maybe one final little burst right in there. But you see they're getting smaller. and. We'll have to wait and see if we have more of these shallow ones picking back in. And this is what I was referring to earlier when I'm talking about that, that pattern. Whether we'll have more of that, uh, that adjustment at the summit. So I'm putting these things out because they're going to go, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the cycle here proposed by uh, Walter and uh, Amalung. And first we'll finish off the earthquake. So I think that'll be really be the best model to put it all in context for you guys and um, answer some of the questions here. So. If we look for the last year here, earthquake rates in depth. Now we're looking at earthquakes per week here on the left. This is a different measure, but we are hitting between 250 and 300 earthquakes per week. This is 50 earthquake increments here. So each of these bars is one week. Right? So going back uh, the past year, you see that there have been uh, ramp ups and then back to background and ramp ups and then back to background and then a ramp up and then back to background and then a ramp up and back to background and ramp up. And so here we are. The pattern has been that the ramp ups have been getting bigger here recently, but we're still in that ramping up pattern. And that's the key thing is we're still taking turns between the, the summit adjusting and the flank adjusting and the summit adjusting and the flank adjusting. And um, that's leading to this kind of pattern, apparently, uh, it seems like anyways. So um, if I scroll back up here, you can see cross section for the past year. Over the past year, how many more earthquakes there are in this summit and upper southwest rift region that we haven't seen as much of recently here. So that's what we're talking about in Matthew there. And this is the past year, so we'll just recap uh, the INSAR that was put out uh, last week by USGS, and this covers a range of uh, November through March. So you do see that broad area of inflation all through here, right? That corresponds to that long-term trend of inflation, and you know the, this this two-month two-month uh, window is catching exactly that that filling part of it, rather than the contracting part of it here. So that's what the filling part looks like, and. We're lucky we'll have good uh, captures from the satellites and good insert that'll show us the contractional part of the phase here um, that's gone on for hopefully they can catch it with it like a two week two week pass or something like that. We have a ten dollars super chat from Michael T. He says uh, you guys are doing a great job. Dan and Philip have a beer on me. All right, thanks, Michael. Hello, Michael. Well, there's that broad inflation. So, but we want to turn to to this idea of the cycle here. Uh, before we, we we take the questions, because I think this might, you know, I'm sure this will uh, spur in some, well, actually will we'll, we'll create some questions, but hopefully it'll answer some questions too, and we can maybe move the, move all of our thinking about how the volcano works a little bit forward. Um, so this is a paper proposed that is is combining the, uh, we've talked about it before, but this is linking volcano earthquake interactions, right? And this was proposed uh, linking the bigger earthquakes uh, that relate to bigger, bigger erup actual eruptions rather than uh, failed eruptions or intrusions or these settling events or these adjustment events, uh, however, however you're thinking of it. So we'll start with a cycle here where you basically have a combination of a summit magma chamber and a summit dike. And as it swells, it puts pressure on both sides of the volcano. Once it push it both ways, but because the ground is deformed and bowed underneath it, it's it has to really swell to to be able to push that mass of of rock out of the way there, and that's part one of the process. I'll zoom in on it here. Yeah, so there is that dike, some magma chamber, very idealized, obviously, but pushing towards Kona and pushing uh, towards Kilauea in this direction over here, wanting to push and push those ways, and as it pushes and is able to actually move. That rock, and it's going to create space in the middle here. 
So you'll create space in the middle that allows all those cracks and fractures that exist to not be squeezed quite so tight. They're like a little bit looser. They're unclamping and they're essentially decompressing. Uh, you get decompression that happens at areas above that boundary. You get compression below that, right? So that kind of induces anything that's down here to want to go up there. And that whole system can then focus activity from the flanks back towards the summit as a summit uh, adjusts there. If you have a big enough earthquake, you really can trigger you know, quite a bit of injection, and that can be what leads to a runaway eruption. But the same process is happening all the time without eruption. And that's what we have to think about here is, is this process where maybe the magma is coming in a little bit more. You are getting some vesiculation, right? That's why I keep looking at the gas. If we see the gases increase, that'll show us that there's a, some path towards the surface. And once that happens, then you know that there's a real potential for an eruption from that point forward. We're not even seeing the gas come out yet. And we are seeing adjustments in the volcano here. Um, so the magma is coming in. You have uh, changes in vesiculation. Uh, they're calling this a triggering phase, right? Obviously, focused on their bigger eruptions in this paper, but we're talking about the smaller variety of that now. And that leads to uh, either a dike intrusion or intrusion and eruption, right? So we're going to talk about the case where we're not going to have a big earthquake. We're not causing quite a shock to the system where that's going to actually fail and cause an eruption. But we're going to have an intrusion where the magma is coming in and it's not actually pushing to the surface all the way, right? That's the, that's the cycle that we're trapped in right now. It hasn't actually come to the surface since 1984, right? Um, it hasn't been doing what it's doing now since then, obviously, but there have been other pulses of injection, right? In particular from 2002 to 2007, where it's been documented by these uh, very same uh, authors uh, with these same models that the magma came in to this probably lower part of the dike area and did not in fact get to this surface part over here. So you can have different varieties, different flavors of this intrusion right, without the eruption, right? And that's the, the, the smaller versions that we're talking about here. And once you have magma come in here, even if it's just coming in here below into the magma chamber, into that shape, that's going to put extra pressure on the bottom of this volcanic pile that wants to slide on that same fault. And that, in turn, is going to cause more earthquakes. Right? So if I zoom it back out, you essentially have a cycle of earthquakes that put stress on the flank, that relieve stress on the flanks, that cause opening of that middle of the volcano that allows magma to come in. And once magma comes in, it puts pressure on the flanks, which causes an earthquake, which then over and over and over again. So the question isn't just, is magma coming in the volcano? It's, it's for us, it's more about what's going to cause it to actually erupt. And... That's where we want to move forward with the paper here. So I'm going to show you guys the reference uh, and JGR uh, back in 2005. Volcano Earthquake Interaction at Mauna Loa, Volcano Hawaii. Thomas, R. Walter, and Falk Amalan. And you know, we they describe how there's key areas here. Right? So first here on the left, these are the historic lava flows in dark colors of Mauna Loa. With a few key ones pointed out here, 1984. It comes out of the northeast rift zone, is one we'll talk about. The 1950 comes out of that upper southwest rift zone, is an important one. And 1868 as well. And of course, there's the caldera right there in the middle. Orientation, Mauna Loa. And it turns out that there are some key earthquakes that have been associated with eruptions uh, of Mauna Loa. And those include, before the 84 eruption, the 1983 6.6, .6, and the Kauiki which occurred right in here. Uh, there was one before the 1868 eruption that was in the Hilea area over here, 7.9. Right, and 5051 was actually, this one was actually after, but there was one before in 49 as well. Maybe it was early, earlier in 50, but uh, there was, this, they actually have a, have a pattern of an earthquake eruption, earthquake again, you know, uh, the cycle, you actually get the, a little bit more of a cycle rather than just, than just one pair, pairing of it over here in the corner area with the 51 eruption right there. But that second one adjusting the flank, 6.9 over there. And so these are, these are the three patches we're gonna, that they're going to talk about and use in the model, um, which they've done essentially calculating the forces underground based on the shape of the volcano, the shape of those magma coming in, and how much pressure the earthquakes are relieving. The signal is shown on INSAR and GPS, and um, all together trying to figure out what's going on here. 
So a little bit more more 3D version of that earlier image, and we've shown this one before as well, talking about the Kauiki earthquakes back when is when that was the first uh, swarm that we saw happening, right? So we saw adjustments happening in Kauiki, shallower and deep and deeper. And we've seen we haven't seen any earthquakes as, as much in Kona. We have there's been a few magnitude threes, but nothing really quite as big. And we saw the ones in Pahala that are kind of cut off cut off here from the from the from the view. But once again, there is that shallow reservoir and dike complex um, that makes up the magma reservoir of the volcano here. So a little more orientation. And this plot we've also shown before, but just to kind of recap it one more time. Um, nine associations of flank earthquakes uh, in short order before, uh, or in some cases also after, uh, an eruption. Uh, the volcano. So that's is, this is what they're basing basing their model on essentially, and we're interested in the the cases where where the earthquakes are smaller than that, which is what's happening now, right? And that's what eventually leads us to you know the the spoiler is going to be we really need to have uh, to to be anticipating an eruption. We we expect to see a big earthquake in one of these areas first. That's going to lead to a more uh, a larger adjustment, which is going to then potentially induce an eruption, right? We haven't had anything big enough. The cycle is happening, and it's happening at a faster rate. So at some point, there will be a bigger earthquake, and then that's the one that's going to be the trigger for that sequence that eventually leads to an eruption. It might take months to years beyond that, right? But that's what they're trying to figure out here. Here is their model. You can see all these little triangles here. That's their grid, and they have the different shapes of the dike and the summit. And yeah, that's how they're calculating the pressures is from that kind of model. And there's a couple of things that happen here, right? One thing that happens is if you have magma come into the system, then it, it actually uh, makes it more likely you're going to have earthquakes on certain parts of the flank. So as we had magma coming into the system and all those summit earthquakes, we, we then had earthquakes in the flanks. And so our earthquakes have been actually happening in Kauiki and this Hilea area over here. Right? And not so much going a little bit over here in the corner area. But that gives us some clue to maybe, okay, maybe it's not a shallow northeast rift zone dike because that's not really matching the pattern of earthquakes that we're seeing here. Right? What if it was a deep northeast rift zone dike? Well, then more so. You actually activate all of the Kauiki area, right? and you activate some of this Hilea area as well. Not as much of the Kona area, so it can't be, if this is what's happening, it's not the only thing that's happening, right? These are not all mutually exclusive. If magma is going into the shallow southwest rift, then you wouldn't expect any of these earthquakes in upper Kawiki area over here. So we don't think that's probably what's happening right now based on the earthquake pattern and the modeling, right? And the modeling only accounts for some amount of reality. There's variations and assumptions that are made, right? But this is a first order approach to how we understand this volcano. And we look at the deep southwest rift zone, and you can see that that encourages a whole bunch of earthquakes on both sides, right? We haven't seen quite as many on the Kona side, um, but we have seen this pattern over here, Hilea and Kauiki areas. And given that this is the Kilauea side, and Kilauea has undergone massive adjustment in the last few years, maybe that's not not uh, a, not a problem to have more of this adjustment happening on the east side and the Kilauea side than on a Kona side. So that's a little bit of a, of a area that we would need an expert to, to chime in here. Um, for now, we have this final piece to add in, which is inflation and that shallow reservoir, encouraging earthquakes also in Upper Kauiki and over here to the Northwest as well, right? That's one of those areas that we're seeing flare off now as well in combination is some movement happening through that zone. There seems to be some pathway that's connected that activates earthquakes in this area over here. And so that's that's one version. So if, you, if you're having a lot of earthquakes happening at the summit, and that's a result or a, a result and associated with magma coming into the system, and it's coming in in one of these areas, northeast rift zone or southwest rift zone, or into the summit, you're then going to encourage a cycle of flank adjustment. And so that's for, that's one way to look at it. And there's the opposite point of view to look at it as well, which is like, well, okay, your flank adjusted. Let's say the flank just adjusted like it did now. Well, then what? Well, depending on how big that adjustment is, and they're doing models here. They did models with 6.2 earthquakes. So this is telling you the pattern of what's happening. 
but it's not telling you what's happening to the detail of right now exactly, right? But let's move in here to the Hilea type decomment real quick. So I gotta zoom way in here. This map, all right, this is the that southern southeast part fault activating as was a case in that 7.9 earthquake in 1868, which triggered the 1868 eruption. So they're looking uh, through the volcano from the southwest rift zone to the northeast, northeast rift zone with the caldera right in here. And they're saying an earthquake in that area is going to cause unclamping at shallow areas, shallower parts of the volcano, clamping below that, but it's going to happen in the upper southwest rift zone part. Yeah, maybe not even the upper, but the southwest rift zone overall. They're actually, it actually goes quite a way over here. I mean, we're talking about Caldera is at zero. So we see effects 35 to 40 kilometers. Uh, maybe 35 kilometers is a better better mark right here, you know, where you might have some might have a, have fissures happening, right? 1868, they went a little bit further. I want to see all the way down to here, but also 1887, right? This is the area that erupted with earthquakes associated in that area, right in there. We have a $35 super chat from uh, returning uh, donator, Gary Bryan. Uh, he says, I appreciate the work you guys do, and thanks to Michael T. Hey, thank you, Gary. Hey, mahalo, Gary. Mahalo. All right, the Kona type of earthquake, right? So if there's a big earthquake in Kona, that's what happened before that 1950 eruption, which has been one of the biggest volume eruptions we've had. So that's one that, that just because we only have that one data point, but it, it does associate, it makes you wonder if that has something to do with the volume there. Um, hasn't always been the case, right? But interesting, that was the one that went off. So an earthquake on the Kona side, a similar kind of plot here, northeast is on the right and southwest on the left. You can see that it actually, compared to before, uh, triggers a higher up part of the upper southwest rift zone. Upper southwest rift zone rather than maybe upper and mid southwest rift zone over here. So a little bit tighter zone, a little bit more constrained when you have that Kona area earthquake. And it's interesting how both of those lead to southwest rift zone nowadays. Southwest rift zone, um, of course, being one of the two options besides the, the northeast rift zone here. If we look at Kauiki, Kauiki is a different, slightly different. Kauiki has got both a strike slip component and it's got a towards the ocean component. And that's probably because Kilauea is over here and it, you know, this is the block that probably is torqued between Kilauea and Mauna Loa a little bit there. And that combined movement, skip a couple of steps here from their research, but they do go into enough detail. Uh, summits over here once again. That actually enclamps a little bit of the upper southwest rift zone all across the summit and the upper upper northeast rift zone. But you notice it's got an interesting clamping effect that comes in because of that strike slip component that occurs 20 kilometers uh, from the summit. So even when you have this northeast rift zone activity, even as it was in 1984, it seems like there is some natural um, you know, there, there's 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 more to overcome for an eruption to go down the northeast rift zone farther than that, and that's an interesting observation because that somewhat fits a pattern of eruptions we see on the map, and this is just straight out of the model like that. So interesting, you know that that protects uh, a little bit more. That might explain you know why why if that Kawiki block is moving the way it is in response to Kilauea being here, that how, how the, Kilo, the northeast rift zone of Mauna Loa has changed since Kilauea has been there to block and start affecting that Kauiki block. So maybe maybe that's too too uh, abstract for some, for some of you guys, but um, it does match some of the observations is the bottom line I'm trying to point out here. Right, so uh, either way, you know, uh, earthquakes can cause, you know, and, and the idea being if you have unclamping, that's going to allow any magma that's around to want to want to go, go into that area, especially if it's pressurized and ready to go through other mechanisms and other variations here as well. Right, so that's the, the, the whole cycle there from earthquake happening, unclamping, and all the way back around there. And so one more time, if we look at this pattern of earthquakes for the past five years, which is the last thing we'll show you guys it all together here you can see that there have been adjustments or earthquakes 
And this is not differentiating, unfortunately, between summit and flank earthquakes, right? But, you know, you can imagine that there is some variation there. And that would give you two overlapping peaks, in fact. But you do have adjustment, whether it's flank or summit, and adjustment, and back down, and adjustment. And we're having, you can see the background level since 2018 has been higher. I mean, a lot more ink on this right side of the plot. But we're still having this sawtooth pattern happening here. And it is ramping up. So it seems like at some point... Uh, it will ramp up to that, but it seems like I'm not saying we want this to happen, you know. But the the thing that we're looking as uh, looking for as that last sign is the bigger earthquake in one of these regions that would induce a bigger adjustment of the magma, which would then potentially a bigger adjustment, bigger chance for eruption. All right, so we're not there yet. The volcano is still so slowly swelling, um, and uh, we'll just keep an eye on what happens next here. So that that's it, Dane. We're ready for some questions. All right. Well, I do want to, uh, you know, make sure everybody knows that we uh, don't have an advertising team. We rely on viewers like you to like, subscribe, share this video. That really does help keep the can uh, channel growing, get more people involved. If you like this type of content, maybe uh, consider even joining HawaiiTracker.com. That's where we post the majority of our stuff so you'll have it in chronological order it really helps keep it nice and clean and if you uh, be so generous or you feel inclined we do take donations on hawaiitracker.com slash support and i do want to thank out one more uh, person who's been a big regular for us on the hawaii tracker site with the donations brian b really appreciate it for the continued support brian with that uh... let's dive into yeah Awesome. With that, let's dive into some questions. Um, so just continuing a little bit, a uh, little clarification question here from Denise, um, talking about what we were just looking at, uh, those graphics. So the pattern of earthquakes can indi indicate where the magma is. That is where the, what the question is. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I certainly didn't imply that. It's not. It depends where the earthquakes are, right? But if we see those shallow earthquakes that are above the area that's the magma reservoir, then that most likely indicates the magma reservoir is swelling and putting pressure on the sides. That's the kind of thing that we saw on Kilauea, uh, that really got elevated beyond the background levels quite a bit before the 2018. Um, I'm sorry, the, the 2020 uh, activity here. Yeah. So. Um, we haven't seen Mauna Loa elevate those background levels around that, that magma reservoir to that point, but that's that is they can tell you those shallow ones can tell you that. And if you see earthquakes on the flanks, that's not telling you as much about the magma; it's telling you the flanks adjusting, right? And so that's why I say you know it's kind of kind of lumped together in these plots here, and I I uh, don't have I haven't been able to s split them out right as possible to go and download all the earthquakes and split them all out, but I haven't have not done that to separate the different plots there. But I'd be interested to see. Right. So, um, Michael T asks in general, can a volcano erupt without earthquakes? Uh, it, it certainly can. Um, it's unlikely that you don't have at least small earthquakes. Um, on, on Mauna Loa in particular, I think a relevant question is, can you have an eruption without this, this uh, precursory uh, bigger adjustment earthquake, right? And, you know, um, I think there have been examples of that happening. Um, so we really don't know. We're just looking, we're, you know, that model that's put together explains most of the time of what happens. It doesn't explain always how, how it goes. And there certainly can be other adjustments. There's adjustments to the to the... To the mantle underneath the volcano that are happening there's a whole input rate into the volcano and that can be variable as we've described recently in some of our uh, special in-depth looks um but yeah it's it's more typical that you see earthquakes building pressure around the building pressure of magma before it erupts and then once it relieves you see the earthquakes drop down almost nothing right that's what what kilauea is doing right now for the most part it's what's happening in iceland for the most part and you see the earthquakes go down quite a bit after you have that steady state path out that can mm. sustain. Yeah, but good we question. We do have a yeah. question that's, yeah, that is a good question. We do have a question about, uh, has there been an eruption in the Kauiki area, like a radial style eruption? I don't believe there has been. No, no. In modern. 
No, but uh, uh, the flows from the northeast rift zone can flow down through that area. Absolutely right. right. So right. Uh, it makes a difference when you have those northeast rift zone eruptions, whether they flow north or south or both. Um, if mm. it goes both ways, it splits the flow two ways, and neither flow is likely to get as far. But if it goes all one way, then it can... Um, yeah, it makes a difference, right? Yeah. To the north, to the north, it's it's a little flatter. To the south, it's a little less. So, if it all went to the right. south, it could be a different story than if it all went to the north, for example. Right. And that north, like the best example of that is that 1880, 1881 flow, which took over two hundred days to try and get towards Hilo. Right. And it's just right. really flat out there in the, the spots until it finds one of those nice little riverbeds, and then it, it it can run. It seems like. All right. So next question. Um, could there be, uh, Sage Pup asked this on YouTube, could there be multiple chambers that push against each other and the strongest push wins, like um, beneath Mauna Loa or between the volcanoes even? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there certainly are different batches of magma that are stored in different parts of the volcano that can erupt with different characteristics. Right? So, for example, the 1868 eruption was a famous, what they call, what we call a pickrite flow, and right? it's very, very olivine rich, like a, almost, almost an olivine crystal flow in, in a sense, right? Um, and that's thought to be because that magma and that farther farther away from that center part of the volcano is erupting as often and so it has more time to cool and to grow those crystals and to have that weirder kind of chemistry similar to on Kilauea the farther over you are towards Kapoho the more likely you can have those those stranger kinds of magma chemistry because you're farther away from the magma chamber and the magma can't get all the way that far as often as it can to somewhere that's closer by right so Makes sense. Um, so yeah um, um that's that's uh that is possible, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to aggregate this question. I've seen it from a few different people. I'm just going to try and mash it into one question. Um, can you describe the characteristics of a Mauna Loa flow and what kind of is and isn't on the table um, and is, or the how common they occur, just generally speaking, about, say, like explosive uh, activity, lava lakes, uh, one was one of the questions was about uh, lahar flows, um, anything along those lines. Basically, it's been so long that I don't think you know. I never I, last time on a lower up it was before I was alive, so I can't be saying like, oh yeah, I, I can I know what to expect in person, you know, as, as to the th as to the flow. Um, it all all the knowledge comes from just watching videos, reading books, reading the research papers. So can you describe those? What are the characteristics of a Mauna Loa flow in general? Well, so uh, Mauna Loa is also a basaltic volcano like Kilauea. So in general, lava flows are very similar, and that character is very similar to what Kilauea is doing. But Mauna Loa is an older, bigger volcano, so it can do things uh, at a different magnitude of Kilauea. So Mauna Loa's lava flows are typically much larger and higher volume than Kilauea's. Uh, Mauna Loa uh, hasn't really erupted that much uh, since 1950. It was the last big eruption. You know, there's been two eruptions since 1950. Mm. So uh, what is that? Uh, 71 years now, right? Two eruptions in 71 right. years. But before that, the average was close to every three and a half years for an eruption. So Mauna Loa had a glory era before uh, before I was born as well. Um, that was essentially from eight, you know, that 1840 era to 1950 or so, and since then it's really dropped back down. Um, so it's hard for yeah. many of us uh, to to uh, to know what Mauna Loa was really like in her glory days and what that activity is really like. There have been lava lakes described at the summit uh, that lasted uh, some of you know a lot a lot of times eruptions at the summit don't last as long at least to a flank eruption. But there have been long-lasting summit eruptions that there was lava lake up there for years, reportedly. Um, it was not the modern era, so people weren't living up there, or there wasn't a satellite to look. Uh, it was whether people saw a glow, reported glow, or someone trekked up there, or some scientist, or something like that, right? Right. Um, Getting so up there is no small feat, um, especially back before there was a road or anything like that. And that's a big hill right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there have been trails. There's a lot of trails, but it's still an effort to get up there, and there's a reason it wasn't yeah. done done regularly for sure. 
So um, that's 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 essentially essentially it. There have been explos explosive uh, deposits found around a summit of Mauna Loa, um, and what those look like are big, dense blocks that uh, don't have any vesicles, bubbles in them, you know, lava that cooled underground. So you know that it was some part around a magma chamber that got blasted out for it to end up on a rim. It didn't flow out like lava to get there. Right, the blocks are angular and sharp, and some of them, you know. That big, you know, like you know, there's some big, big blocks. I've seen them. Um, yeah. So there are explosive. Uh, uh, there's explosive potential as well, but it, but it, it seems like it's it's probably to do with a, with a, like Kilauea. You might have some steam variety explosions, and you might possibly at some point have some magmatic gas driven variety explosions as well. Um, mm -hmm. They're not of the same uh, chemistry of magma here as you have somewhere like St. Helens um, where you do have lahars and you do have uh, more, you know, more consistent pyroclastic flows rather than pyroclastic surges, bay surges or other varieties of collapsing ash clouds. You can have, you can have a, a more extreme version of those, of those flows uh, in the Pacific Northwest or in Japan or in Indonesia, than than on Mauna Loa. Like we don't have any evidence uh, of any of these flows that I've seen um, anywhere uh, outside of this, this, this closer to the summit area, right? That, that is something you worry about more, let's say, on Hualai, to be honest, right? That's a different kind of beast there, mm -hmm. right? But Mauna Loa doesn't, doesn't show that. I mean, that, show, that it's, more, it's more active. It's the, the magma pathways are, have been, have been f filled Right, they've been flowing for you know most of uh, recorded human history here, uh, which is different than Hualai. Right? Mm, right. Um, even still, you know, if, it's interesting because in a modern technological era, right, since 1950 was the last time time it was that that era of Mauna Loa ended. Most of this modern vol volcanology era, uh, with all of, like GPS and satellite, all that, all that's all happened, and Mauna Loa hasn't done a whole lot. There's only been there's only that short seventy five eruption and then one longer eighty four eruption. Right. And one of the interesting, interesting things to me is when we always talk about just the modern history of the volcano, starting at roughly eighteen forty ish. Before then, it kind of gets really gray going back on what actually happened. But at eighteen forty, and we just apply that snapshot and start looking for you know what can we say about Mauna Loa uh, with that uh, two hundred years. Well, or a little less than 200 years. Well, it's highly variable. Um, it, it has times where it's doing a lot and then times that it's not doing anything or hardly anything at all, um, at least on the surface for how normal people perceive it. Um, so it's, a, it's interesting to look at because it's kind of like it's hard to tell exactly what it's doing. Uh, with Kilauea, we had so much monitoring for so many years watching it so closely that People got a feel for it almost, even in a, not being uh, a geologist or a volcanologist. There was a feel for just how it was uh, pro progressing and if it was building up or anything along those lines. Um, Mauna Loa is so hard to say, and that's why we, I think that a lot of the media can get away with uh, you know hiking it up uh, just on a whim. Because it is building, it is weird. It could erupt. It could be building, but it's it it pump, it pump fakes, as I've said before. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 going. You know, now, now hopefully that you guys have seen the the cycle and how the cycle works right. and what you expect out of the cycle. You can see that it's normal for it to do that. And really, it's it's what what can trigger something bigger to happen is really the question, right? And so. Um, oftentimes, in, it comes to the nuance of, of, the, of in these, these discussions. Isn't just oh, something is geologically possible and it can happen, but it's like what's the rate of it happening? How fast is it happening? How likely is it happening? How often? Right, that's what matters. Not that it can happen. Right, right? An asteroid can hit the Earth, but what matters is how often does that happen? Not that it can happen. Right, you know. So it's possible you have a landslide off of the side of the island and this but it's a question of how often does that happen and not if it's geologically possible for it to happen and you know the same thing here with 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 Mauna Loa right you know um so we just have to keep have to keep that in mind this map map I have on a screen here all the red flows are the ones since 1832 that's the the last the earliest uh, uh semi-reliable oral account of an eruption 1832 there so that's the red areas on this map and everything else. Right. Well, back I think here. that. 
going back yeah. to 20,000 years. Well, that really does it on the question side for this episode, I believe. I'm not seeing many more. Um, if we missed right. yours. We will try and handle it in the chat. Appreciate it, everybody. Good job, Phil, and I will pass it to you. Yeah, mahalo, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week on Tuesday with a Kilauea update, and we'll come back to Mauna Loa again next week. We'll keep tabs on it since it seems to be of so much interest, and you know we can keep um, unpeeling some of these layers. Right, there's a lot of different layers we can unpeel. We can, we can, we still have to talk about the explosive aspect of deposits found around the summit. We still have to talk about um, the 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 pattern of historical earthquakes within the volcano, and you know the magma. Um, reservoir, you know uh, how 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 that typically looks, and what you know what we know from seventy five and eighty four. So there's there's quite a lot to still un, uncover there, uh, but we'll just do a little bit at a time um, as it's relevant. And today, the most relevant thing I think is really that cycle, right? That's what the take home message is. Is you know it, it it is it has been the biggest adjustment we've seen really in the last five years. This contraction over the last few weeks, but. If anything, it's bought more time before another eruption rather than directly leading to another eruption right away. It's the opposite sense of sense of swelling that you'd need. The ground was contracting and adjusting, and maybe magma was going back down from the shallower to deeper parts or rearranging itself. And you know, we've seen Kilauea do that in a shorter term cycle. Deflation inflation events are a similar kind of thing, although not exactly a different time scale, right? But the process of moving the magma through different parts of the volcano. So those are things to keep in mind as we wait and watch for what happens in Mauna Loa next. And whenever that bigger earthquake does happen, you know, then we'll essentially have a, 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 a we won't know exactly when it'll fall off from there, um, but it'll be months, months to possibly a year or more, right? And, watch activity grow up you know uh, ramp up at that point and that's that's when we'll be in fourth year so to speak rather than still right. shifting up at this point yeah mahalo everyone definitely makes sense tracker. he's dandy pont i'm philip ong hello everyone <laughs>